Hi, everyone. I think that people is coming into the room. We're getting used to this technology. I do miss the very crowded rooms in the in the basement mm -hmm. of the UN. <laughs> I mean, these events are always so popular that we always have a lot of uh, a lot of people. Sometimes even yeah. security have to come. So, <laughs> given how popular these are. So we're waiting for people to get in. We're still waiting for Annie to, to arrive. So we will wait in a couple of minutes to start. And so please take your seats, get comfortable. And just to ensure that you are in the right event, this is connecting the dots for equality, abortion, empowerment, and sustainable development. So we're gonna have a, hopefully a very lively conversation about how um, people work in different movements and, and working on different areas of, of um, women's rights, gender equality are addressing these issues. And, and the idea is to yeah, have a, a conversation about these issues. So as I said, we're going to wait a couple of minutes uh, while people start arriving. And then um, we're also waiting for one of our speakers. And then we're going to move ahead and start the event. So thank you for being here. I can see that people starting to arrive. So thank you for being here. I was saying at the beginning, we miss being, I mean, I miss the, the, the excitement of being in, in conference room A, like waiting for all the, the room to be packed and, or maybe the room is already too packed. We have a, a lot of participants and then start the event, but it's great having the opportunity to, to despite the, the pandemic and that, to do this and to get together and to have these conversations. And hopefully soon we will be able yeah, to reconvene in person. And of course, to learn from this experience and a big part of what we're gonna talk today, it's exactly about that, like how the COVID pandemic it's have changed our lives. Yeah. So it's great having the opportunity to, to see or friends remotely and, and to have these gatherings. So um, it's 9.05 in New York, 7.05 in Mexico City where I am. So if I don't make a lot of sense at some time, it's because I am sleep deprived. <laughs> and then, <laughs> but again, it's great of being here. So we will start as as I was saying before, we're we're still waiting for one of our speakers, but why don't we start? And and I as I was saying before, this is an event about connecting the dots. Um, um, and the idea of, of, of this event is to talk about abortion, empowerment, and sustainable development. Um, and and to, to have a conversation, I have two great colleagues uh, with me today. Well, I'm Maria Antonieta Alcalde. I'm director of IPAS for Central America and Mexico. 
Um, I I am an activist. I'm a, actually I'm a youth, a retired youth activist. I started doing uh, work on sexual and reproductive rights uh, many years ago, like 25 years ago, uh, as a youth activist, and then I retired and start keep doing advocacy now as an adult. Um, I work several years for International Planned Parenthood Federation in New York, and now I'm I'm happily working for IPAS based in Mexico, leading the work for Central America and Mexico. And I'm very, very pleased to join uh, this panel with Sai Rachella, who is Sai is the Deputy Executive Director at the Asia Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, Arrow. She has been working in the area of women's health and rights, and in particular on sexual and reproductive rights research, monitoring, and advocacy for the past 20 years. So Sai and I had met each other for many, many years. Uh, she co wrote the ICPD Regional Monitoring Report. She has experience working with grassroots, state, national, regional, international, like SAI has been around. Um, she's been actively engaged in the youth movement building for the SDGs in the region and instrumental along with co-conveners in developing a space for young people's discourse through the AFFSD Youth Forum, which are held every year ahead of a, of the Asia Pacific FSB Youth Forum. So, Sai, thank you for being here. It's really a pleasure always to to share a space with you. And I'm also very happy to have here Bethany Van Camper, who's a senior policy advisor at IPAS. Uh, Bethany. Um, she leads the U.S. abortion foreign policy work and specifically the effort to rebuild the Helms Amendment. And we're going to hear a little bit more about this. This is very exciting. Prior to joining IPAS, she worked as a senior policy analyst at the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice and as a legislative fellow in the office of Senator Barbara Boxer. Wow. She received her law degree and master on social work from Tulane University. So thank you, Bethany, for, for being here. Um, and as I said, like this is this is exciting uh, in terms of uh, having the opportunity to see the the reality that we're living and the work that we're doing from different angles. So I will start like making some questions, and then the as I said at the beginning, the idea is to have a conversation. So, so I I would like to to start uh, with you and. And like, I mean, like all the work that Arrow is, of course, one of uh, very important, very relevant organization in Asia Pacific and, and worldwide. And I would like to start, I mean, talking about what, what it's kind of the elephant in the room uh, right now uh, in every conversation, and that's the COVID pandemic. And, and I mean, from many things that we have seen with the COVID pandemic, we have seen that the pandemic has exacerbated the inequalities across the world and social distancing and uh, the social distancing measures and other policies have increased the barrier faced by women and girls accessing sexual reproductive health services, including abortion and contraception. And a recent UN report on COVID-19, it like just told us that the, the pandemic has just reversed decades of progress on poverty, healthcare, education, for all the world, but specifically for women. So my question is like, what is Saro's analysis on the current challenges and how can we ensure a gender responsive recovery? What are your risk? I mean, what's your analysis from Arrow and what are your recommendations? So thank you, Maria Antonietta. Um, it is, um, uh, we are very happy to uh, join this uh, side event. Um, uh, Arrow, basically, we have been working on the uh, issue of right to safe abortion, right to legal abortion for without any restrictions for many, many years now. 
and we have been working in strategic partnerships like you know with the uh, uh, different organizations grassroots organizations our partners at national level and uh, what i'll be sharing with you is based on um, you know the reports and the uh, experiences that our partners um, are also sharing um, overall when we see when we look at the context of abortion the inability to uh, terminate an unintended pregnancy it is an issue in the region and this has implications on sustainable development i mean directly as you know like you know uh, directly it has implications on the goal 5 on gender equality it has implications on uh, the health and well being which is goal 3 uh, but at the same time it also has um, uh, very indirect uh, linkages with uh, the goal 1 on poverty with um, uh, the goal on education uh, with the goal on inequalities uh with uh, the goal on uh, uh, peace and just uh, societies the goal 16 as well so uh, these are the broader level uh, connections that we see but at the same time in terms of targets when you look at the sustainable development targets that are there uh, whether it is like you know reduction of maternal mortality whether it is um, uh, you know universal access to sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights whether it is like you know addressing discrimination uh whether it is addressing violence uh e- even if it is intimate partner violence or non partner violence so um, or also harmful practices so when you look at these targets as well there are connections that actually can be uh, drawn with abortion empowerment sustainable development um and then the whole mantra of the sustainable development agenda is around leaving no one behind so when we look at uh, leaving no one behind then an intersectional lens will actually point us that many of the deaths many of the injuries as a result of uh, uh, unsafe abortions or even persecution of women uh, and girls uh, as a result of the so called uh, illegal abortion these all uh, these disproportionately they affect women they affect girls in rural areas in uh, uh, among women who are coming from poorer households they are uh, they affect women uh, who belong to marginalized communities um, racial ethnic minorities indigenous group but that doesn't mean that it is this uh, socially excluded group that are uh, facing the um, uh, access issues but also everyone but i think the most is uh, what is felt by the marginalized um, uh, sections of the society now adolescents especially now what we see in the region is adolescents especially young uh, and as well as young women they are particularly vul- vulnerable as a result of lack of access to youth friendly services and uh, uh, especially when it comes to confidential and non judgmental services the effects of sexual violence is something that they also face and as a result of not having access to srs services whether it is emergency contraception or safe abortion services is something that we see as um, an issue uh, uh, in the region now um, also when you see the biases in providing srs services uh, especially in the asia region it actually comes within the framework of marriage uh in south asia especially so uh, these are um, you know some of the key barriers that we see um in terms of access issues uh but also uh, you know the healthcare providers um you know uh, resistance to provide uh, abortion services for young uh, women and girls uh that is also something that um, is increasingly becoming a very um you know pertinent issue as such now uh, also looking at like you know a uh, very concrete examples now this is a broad overview of what the barriers are looking like but also looking at concrete examples the contribution of unsafe abortion to maternal deaths is like maybe 8% on official statistics but when you actually look at some of the research data especially in india it actually goes until 16 to 17% so uh, this is an issue it is there we we cannot be silent around the issue of uh, unsafe abortion or access to safe and legal abortion services uh, one of the other uh, trend ex- uh, especially taking the um, india example uh, i am taking india as an example because uh, arrow is actually working in five countries in the region in a very um, um uh, you know concerted manner uh, on access to uh, safe abortion services and india is one of the countries and recent reports that we have from india actually talk about these findings and one is that there is a growing to- intolerance towards induced abortions especially among healthcare uh, providers 
And, um, and then um, we also see that um, healthcare providers, in terms of conscientious objection, this is very real across countries, whether it is South Asia, whether it is Southeast Asia, and in the countries we have interacted, because uh, we also interact with some of our partners in Global South, and this is an issue. Uh, and one another uh, uh, you know, trajectory is also around a growing number of court cases, which are being filed for seeking abortion for child survivors of rape. And in many of the uh, instances where you see the child uh, survivors uh, of rape, for them, uh, the, when the medical options that they are being provided to are mostly around uh, you know, continuing the pregnancy, but not uh, going in for um, abortion, which means there are children who are, who are giving birth to children. And this is also something as a trend or as a barrier that we see that is continuing in this region. Uh, and uh, in the context of COVID that you have asked us, in the context of COVID, this has uh, further exacerbated the situation. We have, um, uh, as a result of lockdowns in many of the countries in the region, in Asia, there is growing uh, uh, you know, incidence of uh, gender-based violence. There is, um, uh, I mean, you know, in some instances, it is as high as a 129% increase in maternal mortality, um, and then a lack of access to uh, maternal health services, um, and then lack of access to um, uh, MBA clinics or even uh, medical abortion. So these are these have been literally aggravated. Uh, even in instances like, you know, in India in April, they, uh, the court uh, actually said that uh, abortion can be, uh, abortion is an essential service. But despite that, when it comes to access, uh, there we did not see any access uh, for, um, uh, you know, safe abortion services. It was not really there on the ground. And this is what our partners are actually saying. Um, I mean, we have been all, we all know about all these barriers and I think we've been talking about all these issues for many, many years. Um, and these continue to be our uh, problems. Uh, but uh, also there are good examples like, you know, of course the Argentina story, um, that is a, uh, you know, we can all take solace um, in like, you know, some positive um, happenings around the uh, right to safe abortion. And that's where I want to come into the gender responsive approaches because it is very crucial for women's groups. It is very crucial for all of us to share and exchange knowledge um, and then um, you know, see how we can learn from each other, whether it is partner organizations, whether it is the women's movement to strengthen our tactics around advocacy, uh, to strategize, to have like, you know, uh, public support. And one such initiative that Arrow is co-creating along with our partners is the SAGE uh, uh, partnership, which is the Safe Abortion Advocacy Initiative, a Global South Engagement. So that's a, a co-created initiative that we have uh, where along with our partners, we are engaging in these learning exchanges, not just within the countries in the Asia region, but also with countries in the Latin American uh, region. And very recently we had this exchange uh, where we had, where we, along with the Latin American uh, friends, uh, celebrated Argentina and we learned from each other what were those uh, multifaceted uh, tactics that uh, uh, came into play uh, for, um, uh, yeah, in the case of Argentina. So that's one uh, approach that we all together really need to uh, keep uh, taking into account. But also, I think we really need to call for decriminalization of abortion, treat it as an essential service, irrespective, whether it is COVID, whether it's a pandemic, whether it is an epidemic, whatever it is, it has to be an essential service. So that is something that we will have to fight towards, but also reform the colonial uh, penal code um, uh, codes and adopt legal frameworks that are that are like you know that are friendly to women that are uh, that are promoting gender equality that are promoting bodily uh, autonomy so these are something that we at the country level can work towards in order to uh, look at that nexus of gender equality uh, and access to safe abortion because they are all the same 
So there's no equality without access to safe abortion. So uh, that is something that we have to look at. I've talked about um, uh, safe abortion services, but also what is important is accountability. The accountability of the duty bearers, the accountability of the health service providers. These are something that like, you know, we really have to be uh, having in place. Um, and we have to work out strategies where like uh, we can enable this uh, kind of an accountability uh, from duty bearers. And last but uh, not the least, um, I think it's also important for us to address stigma and the stigma at the community level, the stigma needs to be addressed at, um, at different levels. I mean, uh, stigma needs to be addressed at different levels and that can only happen when the movement goes to the community, when uh, you know the right to safe abortion is something that the community acknowledges and that will only happen when there is a lot of uh, community mobilization and public support for uh, abortion. So uh, this is where I want to like uh, close and then we can further discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sai. And you, you touch on so many important issues. I think that the fact that the access to safe and legal abortion has been a challenge before the pandemic, like we, we know, and a challenge that has affect the most vulnerable. And, and, and we know that um, that abortion, it's a public health issue, given like its, its contribution to maternal mortality, its contribution to, to morbidity, um, like unsafe abortion, of course. Um, we know that it's a social justice issue because that the most vulnerable women, as, as you well said, are the ones that are being affected. And, and we also know that, uh, as, as you well said, like we cannot talk about gender equality without addressing the issue that like without having a bodily autonomy and the right to choose about our our reproductive lives like there is no gender equality and how this is related with basically all the sdgs um and how also the covid pandemic has exacerbated this reality like uh, the confinement policies had trapped in many cases women with their um, with their their aggressors like it like i mean like we know that se like sexual and gender-based violence is there and in many places the girls are there with the rapists and sadly many of these um sexual violence uh, happens within the family uh, i mean we would like i mean then this is a discussion right now with the agreed conclusions in the in in the um, csw i mean like of course uh, we we understand the importance of of the the family but like the family could be a very unsafe place for a lot of girls and and women and and bef i mean beyond talking the structure of the family we would need to talk about like how i mean what happened within the family and make it a safe space and sadly it's not always and many times it's not a safe space for for women and girls and that we have seen in in the pandemic and then the and how these disparities go in deeper and deeper depending on the national policies. There are countries that had moved faster into into declaring abortion and essential services that it's time sensitive. It's not a service that can wait until we finish the pandemic. I mean, we, it needs to be addressed immediately. And, and actually like a, implementing telemedicine and other and other approaches that could actually speed up the access without putting women in risk and without putting a stress on the public services that's the other thing and and we know that medical abortion is something that we uh, that it's safe that women can take in, at home so they don't need to to uh, put themselves at risk or going at the at the hospital and and we have seen those national policies but we can we have also seen those policies that has decided not to address the issue and had like kind of push women to deal with these issues by themselves and we know in just in latin america um unfpa declared that like the number of of teenage pregnancies will increase almost 20 percent uh, due to the pandemic and due to the lack of access to contraceptives and safe and legal abortion so we 
know that national policies are very important. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna move to to Bethany to talk about national policies. But before that, uh, if you have questions or comments, please use the chat um, to um, to write your your questions. We're gonna be reviewing the chat, and we're gonna have time. Um, at the end of the session for some of the questions. We won't be able to give the floor to anyone due to uh, restrictions in, in time, but like, please use the chat and we're gonna take your, your questions. So Bethany, talking about national policies and how important these are uh, on preventing or, or facilitating access to health services in general, but specifically uh, access to safe and legal abortion, we know that the Helms Amendment is an example of how harmful policies and actions it can be. Can They can deny care, discriminate, further exacerbate inequalities and curb efforts to advance gender equality. And, and I think that Helms, the Helms Amendment could be the poster child of all those. And would we also know that there are finally like clear efforts to um, to get rid of the of the Helms Amendment. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more like about the Helms Amendment for our audience. Uh, and then what policy steps can the United States and current administration take to reduce the harm of almost 50 years limiting the use of UN, US foreign assistance on abortion. So please tell us a little bit about the Helms Amendment and the efforts that are being made to, to get rid of it, hopefully. Yes. Thank you so much, Maria Antonieta. I'm very happy to be here with all of you to talk about the Helms Amendment. And it really is an exciting time because we are now actively, really actively working to repeal this horrible policy. And as you said, it's 48 years old, almost 50 years we've been under this horrible restriction. Um, and its time is up. It's, it's time, it's time for it to go. And so I wanna back up a minute and just level set a little bit about what Helms is, uh, how it's written, how it's applied, some of the harm. And I, I know we're all familiar about this, but um, just to do a little level setting. So as I said, this law um, passed in 1973. And what it says is that it bans US foreign assistance, and then I'm gonna quote it, to pay for the performance of abortion as a method of family planning or to motivate or coerce any person to practice abortion. So one thing we notice off the bat is that this legislative text is quite vague, right? What is the method of family planning? How would you know that that was someone's intention? Um, what does it mean to coerce or motivate someone? How do you prove that? How do you know that? Um, and so what we know is that when there's this lack of clarity, when we're in any way vague in our legislative text and our statutes, it always cuts against women, women and girls, right? And so what this has led to is huge confusion, um, nearly 50 years of confusion. And on top of the chilling effect that we see in these policies, um, you know, there's a complete fear, as we know, to work on anything having to do with abortion, largely because of policies like Helms and the global gag rule and these exported um, anti-abortion sentiments that are coming from the U.S. Um, and so what that means is that Helms is applied not as it's written, not as a ban in cases of family planning or motivation or coercion, but as a complete ban all across the board, a complete ban on services and not just services on abortion training, on abortion equipment, even abortion information and counseling. And so these, the results, the impacts of this antiquated, racist, neo-colonialist US policy made by an old white man, <laughs> it's impacting millions and millions and millions of people, um, you know, thousands of miles away from, from the US and from Washington DC, which is here where I'm based, where I'm working. Why did this policy from you know, 50 years ago have that type of impact and how has it existed for so long? And so that's, you know, that's why we're here. That's why we're so excited about this work. And so you asked me, what can the US government, what can the Biden administration do? Get rid of it. <laughs> this is not rocket science. They need to get rid of it. It needs to be repealed and it needs to be replaced. And so I want to be very clear that this can happen. Um, what often happens with these policies 
is that it becomes, um, I heard someone say this recently, it's an ugly wallpaper that we have on our wall that we don't even notice it because it's been there for so long that there's never the thought to just tear it down. Um, and, and so that's, I think, what we see a lot of the times with Helms. We fail to make the connection that is this policy that is actively contributing to maternal deaths and that we're actually exporting these horrible racist policies um, that have we have no business, absolutely no business doing. Um, and so I also want to quickly point out how antiquated these are, that in the last 25 years, as we know, over 40 countries have made abortion legal. You know, we talked about a little bit about the case in Argentina. You know, this is this movement is growing and growing um, efforts to reduce maternal mortality, promote human rights. And the US is the largest family planning um, donor. So how is it that the US can continue to deny reproductive rights and bodily autonomy, autonomy for millions? Um, and so, again, as I said, this is really the U.S. just tacitly contributing to tens of thousands of deaths, um, and it's, it's time for that to go. And so the bill that I want to talk about, which does this, is called the Abortionist Healthcare Everywhere Act. Um, it is a baby bill. It's not even a year old yet. But this bill has had a huge showing of support um, and we have really good momentum. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about it. Um, so first, what does the bill do? It removes the Holmes Amendment from statute. So that language that we talked about just a little earlier, it just strikes it, gets rid of that family planning motivator coerce, strikes it. And what it does is it replaces it with proactive language. So that says US funding shall be used to provide comprehensive reproductive health care services and information, including abortion services, because we have to be clear, right? No ambiguity, <laughs> including abortion services, training, and equipment. And so this bill was introduced for the first time ever. So again, 47 years this existed, and it's 47th year. We finally said we have to make an effort to get rid of this in, in the US Congress. Um, it was introduced last July. We had a great showing of support. It was led by Representative Jan Schakowsky from Illinois, and then six incredible SRHR champions on the Hill. And in a short amount of time, that bill that started out with just seven women grew to over 110 co-sponsors in two months. Two months. It was wildfire, right? It spread the support. Um, additionally, we had the support of 118 endorsing organizations. So this bill came on the scene with a bang. It, it was noticed, it got people's attention. Um, now that was last Congress, Congress closed and we're now in a new Congress and a new administration, which we're so happy about. Um, and we just reintroduced that bill actually on March 9th in commemoration of International Women's Day. And this time around, we have 142 uh, co-sponsors. So those are members of the House of Representatives who are co-sponsoring, co supporting, putting their name on this piece of legislation. That is unheard of for such a, such a young bill, right? We have huge support. Um, and we have 172 endorsements from organizations from across the board, huge, just incredible um, diversity in this group. We have not only SRHR groups, but we have immigrant justice groups, LGBTQ groups, gender-based violence groups, um, faith groups. We have just a huge showing um, of support in, for this bill, which is, which is incredible. Um, and so we wanna move this bill forward. So I, I don't wanna to go too much into the weeds, but what the bill does is removes homes from statute so from our Foreign Assistance Act, it removes it, but Helms actually exists in two places. So it exists in statute in that law, but it also exists in our spending bills and our, and our federal appropriations. And so we have to have a two-pronged strategy. So while we try to advance this bill in Congress, which we're actively working on, we also have to be having an aggressive appropriation strategy to remove that Helms language from our spending vehicle, the state foreign operations and related programs um, spending vehicle where it also exists. So we have two approaches that we're actively working simultaneously. And so we are gonna push for a hearing for this bill in the House Foreign Affairs Committee. We are going to, as I said, pursue an aggressive appropriation strategy, which is happening simultaneously to remove it there. And we're gonna have to introduce the bill as well in the Senate. 
and we have to have passage in both bodies. And so we have a lot of work to do, but again, I wanna make clear that these are things that absolutely can happen. And if our US leadership prioritizes um, reproductive health care, SRHR services, if, they, if the leadership in the House and the Senate prioritize that and they want to reduce these needless maternal deaths related to unsafe abortion, they will. And we make that case every day. And that is how we will be pursuing um, this strategy uh, in our in our Congress for hopefully hopefully passing <laughs> this bill and once and for all kicking Helms to the curb. Um, one thing I do want to also though make clear is that there are things that we can be doing right now while that happens. As I'm sure everyone knows, changing laws um, takes time, right? It's <laughs> it's a process. It can take yes. a very, very, very long time. And so we we're we're active. We are really hoping that you know these four years, this administration, we are going to make progress on this bill. Um, but until then, there are other things that the administration can do. So the only way to actually repeal Helms, get rid of it, is through Congress. Pre the president can't do it. Not, no one can do it but Congress. That being said, there are things that the administration can do to limit the harm. So when we spoke about the language of homes and the, the method of family planning, what we know for certain is that abortion in cases of rape, incest, life endangerment, that cannot be family planning. So those are exceptions to the way that the law is written. And what the Biden administration can do, what his State Department and USAID can do is to clarify that, to demand that this is the, the, to implement the law correctly to the full extent of that law, it does not apply in those cases of rape, life endangerment, nor incest. Um, and that can happen with guidance um, coming from those departments. And, and you know, it's, that's something that can happen immediately. The other piece of the puzzle has to do with abortion information and counseling. So you would never think the Helms Amendment, the way that it is written, would prevent um, providers from giving that type of counseling or information, right? Why would it possibly do that if this is you no know, abortion as a method of family planning? But it does, and that is that chilling impact. We know that in many countries where IPASS works, um, providers won't eat, will not counsel their patients. They won't say the word abortion at all. Um, and so this can also change very easily with guidance, with the memos to missions and to implementing partners, with trainings to make it very clear that yes, US foreign assistance can be used for abortion information and counseling. We have to have this proactive language because where these policies are nestled, and I have no doubt that this is deliberate, are in all the areas that are written what is prohibited, what you can't do. And then they have a little note that says, this does not apply to information and counseling. Who's going to see that, <laughs> right? It's meant to confuse you. And so we need this guidance, this proactive language that says, no, Helms does not apply to information and counseling. In fact, you can provide and use U.S. foreign assistance for information and counseling. And so we're working actively and aggressively on that. And the one other piece I'll mention is also the president's budget. So um, President Biden will release his budget for fiscal year 2022 very shortly. And we are demanding and urging um, that he does not include Helms in his budget. And that would be a clear signal of his support to repeal. Um, and it would really be a call to Congress to do the same. So just as I said, Helms exists in statute, but also in appropriations, that's the budget. Helms exists in our US budget. So if the president is saying, take it out of the budget, here's what I'm recommending you do, that's, that's a call to Congress to do the same and to remove it from their budget that they actually have to pass. And so we were hoping for that, we're hoping for that as well. So we have our work cut out for us. We have multiple approaches, working with Congress, working with the administration, um, and we're really excited about the work. We have a great coalition here in Washington, D.C., uh, working to move these things. Um, and as I said, we're really excited about this growing um, partnership that we have with all of the endorsing, endorsing organizations um, that are standing in support of us, 172. So we're thrilled. Great. This is, this is so exciting, Bethany, because... I mean, I think, as as you said, like, I mean, um, Helms is one of those uh, 
protest. <laughs> like, but it, I've been there kind of like, I mean, like a, it feels that it has been there forever, that it's right. it's impossible to remove. And I mean, like this, this exciting movement of saying like, this is not right. This is not right. Like we know that the U.S., Foreign assistance cares about about women, as you said. Like the U.S. is like, like even like with a, with any administration, it's a, a very significant player on family planning, uh, on on reproductive health services. But these restrictions, these restrictions on reproductive health, really prevent women from having access to comprehensive services. And when we think about, for example, um, humanitarian assistance, like mm -hmm. women that had already suffered a lot that are displaced that sadly through those displacement, many of them suffer um, sexual violence, rape, and are pregnant due to those rapes. Um, I mean, like providing mm -hmm. um, abortion services, it should be, I mean, a priority it should be like really a priority. And I really like uh, even the title of the bill as like abortion as healthcare, because yeah. I think that that's, uh, and as you said, it's it's an intention, it's an intention, it's intentional, this idea of stigmatized abortion, it's yeah. intentional, this idea of a, uh, like, thinking of abortion as a different thing that as a healthcare service when it's actually that it's I mean a basic healthcare service that like women need in many times in like through many women need through the reproductive life so uh, and I have already many questions like from from the audience on on the bill and on, on other things but like let me like just make mm -hmm. one round more uh, talking about these about stigma and um, we know that one of the of the barriers or like the challenges to to work on abortion is exactly stigma. Uh, as a global community, we tend to work in silos. And I mean, like people working on different things, and this idea of like working on reproductive health uh, and COVID nineteen makes these reality even more complex. There are so many barriers for women empowerment, and we already said like although women empowerment has of course, a lot of elements, like, I mean, a lot of issues to address, economic empowerment, education, access to um, a different type of services, sexual reproductive health, specifically reproductive health, in this case, is fundamental. I mean, like, if women are, are permanently pregnant, if they cannot control, and they're, like, as I was saying, for example, in the case of rape, um, they cannot control the reproduction, and they are, like, permanently pregnant pregnant and having more children that they can they can provide care for uh, it will be impossible to talk about um to talk to talk about real real empowerment so um and how can we build a more inclusive powerful global reproductive justice movement during and beyond COVID-19 I think that as I said like even within the movement sometimes the abortion is the the hot issue, the the uncomfortable issue. So, like from your experience, like maybe two questions: What barriers do you see, and what uh, collective actions we can take to move and to remove the stigma, and to remove uh, uh, the challenges that we face, to to push for a comprehensive agenda, and how can we build this inclusive global movement? Uh, so, if you can answer these, maybe like three or four minutes, and then we will uh, read some of the of the questions. So, Sai, do you want to start? Yeah, surely. I mean, um, as I've said before, that, uh, um, uh, I mean, engaging uh, within us amongst the uh, women's groups and amongst uh, each other, uh, not just within the countries in the region, but across regions. I think that is a good way for us to strategize, learn from each other. I mean, that's, um, I mean, to look at different strategies that would actually help us uh, address stigma, address like address uh, different barriers, whatever the barriers are in. Um, but uh, that's uh, one uh, approach that we can look at. Uh, but uh, to address stigma overall, we will really have to look at uh, gender equality, reinforcing that. So access to education, access to like empowering uh, women and girls, especially girls, uh, empowering them through education and including comprehensive sexuality education um, and um, uh, having access to SRH services 
uh, at all points in time, that will be uh, um, a way forward, which will uh, reinforce. So access to um, education, including comprehensive sexuality education, but also access to economic uh, opportunities, the overall realm of gender equality and uh, you know, um, addressing violence uh, against women and girls, if all these are taken into account, I think that will also pave a way uh, towards addressing stigma also in the uh, communities. So to overall, I think empowerment has to happen at the individual level that has to be supported by the uh, communities and um, uh, public education and public support is something that will have to. So it is a multi-pronged strategy that will have to work uh, from all the experiences that we have seen across. Uh, it, there's no one single solution to, um, uh, to uh, the right to safe abortion. Um, and stigma persists, whether, you know, even, even in countries where the grounds on which abortion is permitted um, is um, the most liberal, including on request, stigma still persists. So um, the way we will have to work at it is starting from the micro level at the individual level and then grow it up to uh, the community, lead it into uh, a public awareness and like, you know, uh, enable public support, but also reinforce the laws and policies that will again be supportive. So a multi-pronged approach is required to address stigma and it will take some time, definitely. Thank you very much, Sayan. And I think that, that that's, yep, yeah, I think that that's very interesting, like to think like we, we, we need to have a comprehensive agenda and to work at different levels. And I know there are several organizations and, and that's the power of, of the women's movement. And you were mentioning Argentina, for example, in terms of like you, where you can actually see a huge movement who've been working for years. I mean, like, and, and who has been including a, this, this, like it remove the stigma from from abortion as, as a component like to reach a, a kind of the support like to get the support from the community but also to achieve the political change so bethany what do you think about this Thank you so much. I agree very, very much with um, with with everything that Sai said, and I think that, and I'll speak mostly in terms of stigma that I'm seeing in uh, you. U.S. government spaces, because that's more of where I'm working, but it's actually saying the word abortion. Um, and as you had mentioned, that's why we wanted our bill um, to be named the Abortionist Healthcare Everywhere Act. And we had pressure from a lot of people that said, well, does abortion have to be in the title? Do we need to say that? And we said, yes, it absolutely does, because it is so easy to hide behind other issues and say, well, this isn't really an abortion issue. This is about A, this is about B, this is about C. But as Sai said, it's all interrelated. We can't have equality if we don't have access to abortion services and are able to make our own decisions for ourselves to have self-determination. And so I think we have to name that issue. We have to say the word abortion, not hide behind it. And we have to make clear that abortion is not separate from other healthcare. It is not on its own. It is absolutely a part of essential services and it is a human right. And I think whenever we back down, whenever we even show an inch of weakness on that in our stance that abortion is healthcare, it will get exploited. It absolutely will. And so we have to remain firm in our commitment um, and sometimes that's hard to do, especially when you're talking about um, how, how to advance things, how do we compromise, how do we, how do we move something forward, but certain things you can't compromise, and this is one of them. Um, you know, our bill to repeal Helms is squarely about abortion. It's not about contraception. It's not about other reproductive health services. This is about abortion. And we, um, we embrace that. And I think that what we often see in the US government, particularly in negotiations around funding, and when we're talking about the global gag rule, which is an equally horrible policy, but a lot of times what they will say is, well, we don't need the global gag rule because we have the Helms Amendment. The Helms Amendment already prohibits U.S. foreign assistance from going towards abortion services. That's the law of the land. Helms Amendment is the law. So get rid of the global gag rule. It's unnecessary. 
But what is that really telling? What, what are you saying when you say that? You're saying, oh, well, that's how it should be. Yes, get rid of this because it's not needed because you're already covered. This already does that. And when I hear that, it's nails on a chalkboard for me because it shouldn't be that way. We don't want to say that homes is the law of the land. We are changing the law of the land. And the only way we're gonna change that is when people stop saying garbage like that, quite frankly. We need to be firm in, in that in that stance. Um, so those, those are things that come to my mind in terms of removing stigma. And, and you know, this goes all the way to, to President Biden. Um, we've yet to hear the word abortion come from his mouth. How is that? You know, how, how are we acknowledging the anniversary of Roe v. Wade, the decision that legalized abortion in this country? And, you know, from any public account, we're not saying the word abortion. The Roe v. Wade decision was about abortion. And so that's another step where we have to be really holding our elected officials all the way to the president. Every single one of them needs to be using the word abortion. Um, so, so those are my thoughts on stigma. And then I'll really just quickly add again, as we're building a global reproductive justice movement and we're making these connections, I think absolutely learning from each other and actively supporting each other. So for every of those 172 organizations that endorse this bill, you better believe I'm going to be working to push IPAS to, to be supporting their efforts as well. It's a two-way street. We have to be supporting each other. It's absolutely critical. And, and for adjacent movements, as I said, the immigrant justice movement, LGBTQ movement, uh, gender-based violence movement, all of these things intersect. And if we're only interested in pursuing our own uh, SRHR agenda and not supporting other groups and not making those connections and seeing how everything is actually the same and connected to each other, then we do ourselves harm. And so I think we have to very actively be aware of supporting our partners in these other fields as well, just as they're supporting us. Um, and that, that's how we build a collective movement. Thank you very much, Bethany. I really like several things of what you said in terms of like this idea of the collective movement and, and how we need to support each other. I mean, like what happened in the US is as, as important as what happened in Malaysia or what happened in Ghana. And like, I, I think that this idea of like, like how like making those connections and and wh what do you say in, like in terms of like i think that like the like working on on decriminalization of abortion and making abortion and a uh, healthcare uh, service it's i mean working for um to ensure that motherhood is not forced working to ensure that actually women can choose and 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 aiming for a, for a right future but at the same time as you said like abortion has already this connotation that it's not, I mean, that it has been given. I mean, like there is, of course, and and we have like some people from here and like from the other like, audience asking like some questions in terms of, I mean, this is, I mean, this is this idea of putting the stigma on abortion. And and, and, and as you said, with that, Bethany, it happens to the elected officials, but it's also, I mean, it's affecting the women, that woman that had to go through an abortion and and like, she cannot talk about it. She cannot mention the word. She, I mean, like, and and that's that's not fair. That's not fair. Even like, like, I mean, like, legality. Legality is one step, but even like in in settings where abortion is legal, like in the case in in Mexico, um, in the case of rape, or in Mexico City, uh, that it could be elective. Like women go through this process uh, with a lot of challenges that are not for the service itself. It's due to this stigma that as a community, as a society, we put an abortion that's so unfair on on women. Um, so I, I really like what what you what you what you said, like in terms of like a creating, not working in silos, creating linkages between the work that we do. So thank you for that. And now I've, we've been receiving like a, several questions. So I will try to to group some of, of them. Um, maybe for for Sai, um, I mean, there's a lot of like questions that are related, like how international agreement like the Beijing or the ICPD or the SDGs support the decriminalization of abortion. Like, I mean, people even quoted some of the of the um, 
of this agreement saying like this doesn't talk uh, about the criminalization of abortion how it's this linked i mean like these international agreements with the notion that we need to move into making abortion um what it is a healthcare service so like if you can explain a little bit more uh, and maybe related to that like i mean like several questions on like how how abortion is empowering for women like questioning or how does it have to do to do abortion with with uh, with women's empowerment so some questions about like people like uh, yeah like with questions about like how is this related with women's empowerment so maybe you can talk on those two issues in terms of a, a women's empowerment and the relation to abortion and, and and also like like people saying like the international like some of the of people in the audience is say, like saying like how are these international agreements linked with with abortion or decriminalization of abortion and in the case of uh, Bethany a lot of uh, like interest in the bill like people asking how can we support the bill what can we do um, like for you to repeat the name of the of the of the bill um and and mo i think that most of all like like asking about like what can people do to to support to support the bill and i think it's both um american i mean be like us uh, people but also uh, people from other parts of the world so we can start there um so Sai, do you want to start Okay, in terms of um, international commitments pertaining to women's health and then their relation to um, abortion, I think we all know that, you know, it is limiting. I mean, uh, even within the ICPD um, uh, and as well as uh, the Beijing, like, you know, to say within the law, I mean, like, you know, within the legal uh, uh, domains of the respective countries. So, um, so while, uh, you know, the international commitments can be used in order to uh, like, you know, work within the legal framework in respective countries where there is access um, and then ensure that services are being provided within the so-called realm of legality. Uh, I think avenue of the international commitments will be more from the human rights uh, council spaces. I think, uh, especially for abortion, I think working from the human rights uh, uh, council spaces will be the way to go. Um, especially the resolutions that we can, uh, you know, um, uh, look at, uh, especially the maternal mortality resolution and some work around that that can actually relate to uh, the right to safe abortion. I think that will be a more concrete way in establishing uh, abortion as a right uh, and then taking that from that space into the uh, New York spaces. Uh, and then seeing uh, and also integrating it into the SDG um, uh, uh, follow up and review that happens at the HLPF or it, it or even the regional mechanisms that we have. So um, I see with abortion, uh, the work can start from the Human Rights Council arena um, and then it can get translated here. Uh, but also uh, taking it back at the country level. I think we have experience working uh, as Arrow with our partners, where uh, we look at different recommendations coming from the uh, Human Rights Council, uh, coming from the UPR. Um, and um, uh, it's a very circular kind of advocacy that we work where uh, the situational reports in the UPR come from women's perspective. Um, and we uh, talk about the situation of, uh, um, you know, uh, abortion or situation of women's rights, sexual and reproductive health and rights. Uh, and also we lobby at the HRC spaces where the questions um, uh, to the respective governments are asked when they are reviewed around their UPR. Uh, and then we then work with those uh, recommendations uh, and then pick it back and then bring it back at the country level and hold the uh, country level, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, decision makers to account to say that, you know, this is a recommendation that you have agreed or uh, acknowledged and then what is it that is happening at the country level around that? So um, that whole, uh, you know, tying in the loop um, and that is the way, uh, that is the space where the international commitments help us. We, uh, whatever is progressive, we try to bring it back at the country level. If the, at the country level things are not uh, progressive, so you have to see that balance. Um, and then uh, sometimes if at the country level, 
um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the law is more progressive, uh, then uh, we will, I mean, you know, then we will have to see how we can actually relate it with other countries in the same region. So this uh, cross-regional learning, uh, the inter-regional learning, um, these are some things that we try to do as a regional platform because Arrow is a regional platform. So that gives us that avenue in order to bring together women's groups, bring together our partners to share and learn from each other and then see how you can uh, yeah, push the envelope around uh, national laws and policies to push the envelope of uh, safe abortion forward. Thank you very much, Sai. And and I think one, one element that it's important also to highlight on, on international agreements is like, like in one hand, as, as you will said, like how they are connected and how the restrictions on, on, on abortion actually harm the women's empowerment and the development and actually harm the most vulnerable, but like, because like um, women with resources, I mean, like um, in every country, every the country with the most restrictive laws. And I, I mean, I work in Central America where we have most of, I mean, some of the countries like with, is this the region with the most regressive laws on abortion? Uh, I mean, women with resources can have uh, access to, uh, to safe abortions like with their gynecologies or they can fly to Mexico or to the US. So it's the women who are actually in jail in El Salvador, for example, for abortion are all poor, are all indigenous, and most of them are young. So uh, we can see that like this is our this is a practice that are targeting a specific population, but it's completely I mean, against human rights, and also it's complete. I mean, it's harm uh, the possibilities of development of of these women and this and this population. And the other element that I, I feel it's also important that it's many uh, of these um, agreements, including Beijing and including the uh, the ICPD, the Cairo. Uh, I mean, they both talk about that when abortion is legal it should be accessible and safe. And that's the other thing that we don't have in many countries. In, in most of the countries of the world, actually it, abortion is legal for some um, reasons. Um, but in most of the country of the world, especially in developing countries, abortion is not accessible for women. And that's a clear commitment. So I think that we need to to work on both fronts and like in like understanding that that abortion is an essential healthcare service and when it's legal it's 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 more likely to be safe for women so um so like to be comprehensive and and address all the elements but when it but also when it's legal it should be accessible and that's already a commitment and we will need to work towards towards that so let me give the floor uh, to Bethany and then we can come back to this. Uh, Bethany. Yes. Um, so before I address some of the questions about the bill, I just want to speak a little bit about stigma. Um, and I think particularly, you know, when we think that and we, you know, say abortion is healthcare, but we have to really we have to understand how the stigma is formed in order to break it. And so, for example, speaking specifically about US laws um, for abortion, we this is a procedure that is so regulated that to access what is technically my constitutional right, I will have to go through mandatory counseling, mandatory ultrasound, wait for up to 72 hours, I have to jump through it's an obstacle course of yeah. everything that you have to go through to get what is technically my constitutional right. And all of those contribute to stigma. Is there any other medical procedure that you have to go through a laundry list of these requirements that are designed to make you second guess the decision that you make? Any procedure? The answer is no. And I'm thinking even in one of the Supreme Court oral arguments that I was lucky enough to hear, there was a question about this, and I believe the analogy was made to liposuction, which is technically more dangerous than abortion, and no one has to answer any questions about anything having to do with that metal medical procedure or colonoscopy or these other things that apparently are more dangerous than abortion. And so I want to be clear that stigma often comes from the very laws that are put in place. But the only way that we can change those laws is by actively fighting that stigma. 
um, we're, we're not going to change them by being quiet. And part of that is sharing stories that abortion is healthcare and, and breaking that silence. And this is different for everyone. And it takes many people years and years to share. I am someone who had an abortion as a young person about 20 years ago. And it took me so long to be able to share that story and to tell even anyone because of stigma. And I think that there has to be this active effort to share. It's okay to share this story if you're comfortable to because having an abortion is part of healthcare, that's it. And so I, I wanna be, be clear that when we're talking about stigma, um, we need to know where it comes from and, and, and we need to actively challenge it even though it's scary and hard. And we are design, it, it's designed to make you feel scared and ashamed and small and alone. And the reality is that no one is alone because abortion is incredibly common across the world. And so I think that we, we have to embrace that and we have to really stand firm in our truth about that. Um, so that's one thing I did wanna say about stigma, but in terms of the bill, <laughs> the name of the bill is the Abortion is Healthcare Everywhere Act. Um, and in terms of what you can do, I, there are certain limits, but for, for people that are based in the US or groups that are based in the US, first of all, please reach out to me. Um, would love to, to connect and to learn more about what you can do, but we will have letters, we will have petitions. Um, a lot of this is about education, community education, where many, many people don't know what Helms is at all. And so organizing community events and education, um, and particularly as well, you know, for targeting members of Congress, we have to get to 218 votes in the House of Representatives alone. And so, as I say, you know, we have great support. We're growing something and we, we will get hopefully very close to 200 co-sponsors on this bill. And if people are not on the bill, they're still, they're still very likely to vote with you, but it's going to take work. And so, you know, that means for people who are based in the US, let me know where you're based and we can connect you with your member of Congress to make sure that they're supportive of this bill. Um, and in terms of our international partners, I really think social efforts with social media. There are US laws that restrict um, what um, basically what uh, foreign um, groups would be able to do to implement US laws. There's international lobbying laws that are very complex and, um, and restrictive, quite frankly. So I think that we have to um, kind of think creatively about different ways to engage. And I certainly will think more about that, but one um, is our social media campaigns. And so please reach out um, and we can, we can find ways to be working actively to to pass this bill. Thank you very much, Bethany, for, for all the information, for most of all, for, sh for sharing your, your story. And I and I completely agree with you. I think that like uh, the stigma also creates like pain in people that have gone through abortion. And, and I think that we, one element that you said, I'm very sure that we all know someone that has gone through an abortion or some or ourselves. Uh, and, and it is important to share these, like even if we, I mean, like if, if you, even within your families, like many times when you ask mm -hmm. your grandmother, your mother, your aunt, your aunt, uh, I mean, the, the stories are there. And actually um, in Mexico, I pass with, with other organizations, like we put together this site um, uh, for women to share their stories, and it has been beautiful. It has been beautiful, and painfully, painful in 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 some cases, but liberating and empowering uh, for many women. And it's very interesting how the abortion experience could means like many things. And and actually, I I thank Joyce. Uh, who Brown, who share her own story, uh, like as a question, and I was about to go to there, but anything and you like, you're like saying that for me it was painful. For me, it was it was difficult to 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 get an abortion, and 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 I think that you can have like these diverse stories, but what we know for sure, it's that when it's legal and when it's safe. It, the, the, most of the time, that story, maybe not all the time, and like, as you said, there are so many barriers that are being imposed, all this stigma about like, you need to 
think it twice. You need to see the ultrasound. You need to talk to your partner. You need like to have mm -hmm. a nana, like, I mean, your parents approve. Like you have all these like a fear around it, like that make it very difficult. But like for like for for like the, the stories that I've seen, like for many women is like, for me, abortion was the most responsible decision I've ever made because I already had these many key children and I couldn't afford having another one. Like it was difficult. And for most of women, and I think that this is also important to say, like I haven't met and I have met a lot of women that have gone through a abortion. I've never met once that it was like, oh, this was so easy. Like, I mean, it was like, it is a decision that you make in conscious, like, um, like, I mean, knowing your own reality and a portion, it's about trusting women. It's about uh, knowing that women know what is better for them, not patronizing them, not telling us that someone else know better, like knowing that each woman knows its own reality and has the knowledge and the power to make decisions about her life. So like, I mean, like, and I know this is controversial, but at the end it comes to, um, ensuring that no woman goes through a forced pregnancy and that motherhood is actually something good that happened to women. And I think that we can, I hope that we can all agree on that. And, and, and the other thing it's about trusting women, trusting that like, like she knows what is better for her and giving her the tools and the information and the knowledge to make that decision. But at the end, trusting us trusting her to make this decision. So I, I really appreciate many times in these forums. I mean, we talk about many things, but uh, but not about the the core that is at the at the center of this decision is that woman that is facing an unwanted pregnancy or many times it's a pregnancy that was actually wanted. But then the situations, and we're seeing this in COVID. I mean, like that women that wanted to get pregnant, but suddenly. Her partner is deceased, she lost her job, she is sick, and suddenly that wanted pregnancy, it's not anymore. And, and she had to make that decision, but like trusting that that woman has whatever is needed to make that decision is it's I mean I think that's that's very important so we have so some few minutes and I and I just wanted to close like if you like we have a lot of questions and thank you everyone but I wanted to close like we talk about like breaking the silos and and not a uh, and not um kind of work together and Sai already you talk about some programs about sharing uh, knowledge between what is happening in Latin America and what is happening in, in Asia. Uh, if we can close with like maybe some examples, like we, we have several questions about like, do you have examples about uh, how are we breaking the silos or maybe examples of how are we actually enforcing the silos or strengthening those silos that we know are not the way that we want to, to work. Uh, so if we can close maybe with some examples that we could, or inspirations or things that we shouldn't do, like uh, so we can work together better during the COVID or even beyond the COVID. Um, so uh, Sai? Um, I would not uh, um, uh, really share an example at this point because I mean I've already shared the example but what I would actually second what you just said about trusting women's decisions um, and that is something like you know that's the core um, uh, a core to uh, women's empowerment that is core to gender equality and the sustainable development agenda is about a transformative ambitious approach and for gender equality goal, if we are saying that we are trusting women's decisions and, uh, and that is our indicator, um, and then that is the way forward that we can look forward to it. So I would really go by that. And I'm very happy you brought this um, uh, issue of trusting women's decisions. When they have all the information, just let us trust them. They will make their own decisions. Every woman is empowered enough to make her own decisions. So thank you. I with this. Thank you very much, Sai. And I think that that's a very inspiring way to put things. This is about trust. It's about trusting women. I've been giving her like reliable information, giving her what she needs, but at the end, trusting that women can make the, the best decision for for her own life. And that, and that these decisions impact their, their, I mean, the future. Like this is related with, 
development. This is related with with women, like maybe like a like saying like I would like to be a mother, but this is not the time because I need to get educated or like a, and then creating the policies that will help because if you live in a society and actually we have some questions about like male preference a, a, um, in terms of if you leave a society that that will punish you if you don't have a baby boy or like I mean like then that those situations needs to be changed like uh, if you live in a society when you're going to be fired if you if you get pregnant or if you live in a society where like I mean like uh, people will like like you will, will be homeless like if you get pregnant then I mean like we need to create if you are concerned about abortion create a better society where actually motherhood is embraced and women are not punished for being a mother and and then let women decide so do for those in the audience who are like so concerned about like um reducing abortions or against abortion my one of my recommendations would be um we know that criminalizing abortion is doesn't reduce the need. We know it. Like, I mean, just make it more dangerous. Like, the discussion here is not uh, in favor or against abortion or like legal or not legal abortion. Actually, the question is like safe abortion or not safe abortion. So, like, because the abortion need is there. So, but if you care about this, there are different things that actually reduce the uh, the need of abortion um, and that I can think of three things uh, and then I will give the floor of course to Bethany to close I can think of three things that reduce the need of abortion that's access to contraceptives comprehensive sexuality education and reduce stigma I mean like and and like I mean actually embrace motherhood so those three elements if you want to reduce the need of abortion if you really care about reducing the need of abortion please invest in these things and because like criminalizing it's not the answer it has been proven so Bethany please Thank you for sharing that. I agree so much. I think those three things are the key. And, and something that I want to raise is that oftentimes the people who, who don't support abortion also don't support those three things that you just said. And to those people, I draw the I think we have to question what is this really about? Is this actually about abortion? Or is this actually maintaining a system that inherently um, subjects women to discrimination and keeps them in a state where they're not able to actually control their lives and to actively participate in, in civic society? I think that we, we know that the means to control one's reproduction is absolutely essential to their contribution to society and to their own realization of themselves as a person. And so I completely agree with you with, with, with those three things and that's what's needed. And I just would say that sometimes we have to think those who are against abortion, do they support those? And if they don't, why not? Why not? And if this really is about um, be, you know, is it about, uh, is it against abortion or is it actually just against women? And that if women are constantly pregnant or constantly having a young child, who's able to always be in power? Who, right? This is a means to oppress women. And so I think that we have to, um, we have to sometimes dig a little deeper and go a little further um, into, into what, what this really is about. But the way to, to reduce unintended pregnancy are those three things that you said. This isn't rocket science. Those are absolutely essential. And that's what we should be, that's what we should be supporting. And we should also embrace that there will always be need for abortion and that abortion is healthcare. And, um, and we have to actively fight that stigma. Thank you very much, Bethany. And thank you everyone who has been here and who has been in the audience. Uh, there, there are uh, different questions and I know that we may not have time like, and we were like, we're closing, but like, um, like a lot of like comments in the audience about um, the quality of the services, people who had uh, attended some of the services and, and may not receive the quality and the need to pay attention to mental health. I'd like, I think that we we couldn't agree the most, I mean, the most like it is important to ensure that the quality is high and it's really comprehensive. And 
And the only way to to do this is actually to to make it legal. I mean, like in order, like like I mean, like if if you get again, if you care about healthcare, um, and if you care about the quality of the care, including mental health, and 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 um, this is important. Um, making it legal then you can regulate the care you can like it like if, while if abortion is illegal then you cannot regulate the quality of service that women are getting it so again if you're in the audience and you and you care about this issue um uh, legality is what makes you actually um, have some possibility to uh, to ensure that like like bad healthcare providers are not in the picture because there are regulations to 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 do this uh, um, and then oh I know that a uh, like that Annie is in the room and Annie we are not able to see it we didn't know that like like if you made it so uh, Annie are you in the room? And I don't know if she can, your speaker, so you are supposed to be able to speak. And and I mean, just to say, like, we were waiting for another speaker. Uh, um, so like, uh, uh, that's why I was like, oh, Annie, are you here? So Annie Moody, who's the executive director of FIA Mama, um, who is a Congolese um, activist um, working on women's rights, HIV AIDS. And we were very excited to have this conversation also with Annie, but I don't know if she is in the room. I was just ready to just receive a note saying, that she was in the room, but uh, but I think that it has this has been a very lively uh, conversation. I think that like it's interesting how like every time that you make these types of of, of panels, when you can go in every direction, it will really depends on on uh, I mean the questions, but also uh, the the panelists. Uh, so I think that closing with this, and I really like that we went from the COVID. Um, kind of like the impact of COVID on, on sexual reproductive health and specifically the topic that we're addressing today, that it's abortion. And, and we end up coming back to the core of this discussion that is actually women. I mean, like that that woman that, as I said, is facing an uh, unintended, un, unwanted, un, un viable uh, pregnancy at this at this time, because all the work that it's about that we're doing from the Helms Amendment to the conversations between Latin American and Asian uh, activists to the work that we're doing during these two weeks during CSW from abroad from or abroad. in New York. It's about that. It's about women. And I know that and I and I want to I feel that everyone um, in this in this room, everyone who engage in 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 coming at the CSW, is because you care about women. And as as Bethany was saying, it, like if you care about women, prosper. If you if you care about women, check what is your agenda. And and if your agenda a uh, corner women and do not give her possibilities to decide about about her life and that is denying her the information that comprehensive sexuality education gives her denying her of access to contraceptives uh, denying her of the agency uh, uh, that she needs to make decision because other people had made the this like has to make the decisions for her or putting so many barriers for her to make decisions then maybe you need to check your agenda and to ensure that this is about women. So I I would like to end this conversation on that note, that that, and that invitation to all of us to go back um, to the principles that, that guide our work, that I'm sure it's very important, and to ensure that, that we that we have that put women in the center of our work. So thank you everyone. Bethany, Sai, thank you for being here. And I send you a, a big hug that I hope that I will be able to give you in person soon. So thank you everyone. And thank you to Ceci Espinosa from IPAS who organized this panel and who is like a, a amazing and everyone who participated in, the, in, in, in putting together this panel. Thank you very, very much. Oh, but Ani, Ani's here, she can talk. Oh my yeah. God. Thank, thank you Annie. so much. Uh, my apology for having connected late. I'm on the ground in the eastern part of the DRC.
and uh, I really appreciate, I, I, I heard all, um, all the presentations and uh, the very good landing on the three points and also Bethany's point on all, what is this all about. Uh, in my experience working and promoting women's bodily autonomy, because all this is about controlling women's body by the patriarchal system. So they will find a way and a word to, to, to explain why, to get reasons for why uh, abortion shouldn't be uh, a choice for women. So in, in our context, I, uh, actually in the DRC, we have used a uh, Maputo protocol, which has expanded exceptions on abortion to push for abortion in the DRC. As it stands right now, abortion is still illegal according to our penal code, but pro coming together in the coalition against uh, uh, unwanted pregnancy, we have put together a coalition of uh, national NGOs as well as international NGOs to push for Maputo protocol implementation. And this has brought us to a, a situation where we are now able to talk about unsafe and safe abortion, but we still have few limitations because we have to stay within the limit of Maputo protocol that uh, opens or uh, allow abortion in case of rape, in case of mental health, and in case of uh, uh, incest, and also uh, uh, if the pregnancy has medical complications. And the other challenges we, we, we had was about with our, our doctors, uh, regulations that before you need, they needed three doctors to attest this women can get uh, abortion or not. And before the three doctors as signed, most of the time the baby was born or the woman died uh, during the, 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 the practices of unsafe abortion. And so uh, in terms of language, we have taken the approach to link abortion with economic situation because whether it's illegal or not, when a woman doesn't want a pregnancy, they will get rid of the rid of it anyway. So uh, we are attacking the roof causes, but also trying to go behind the, the two challenges that I've just raised now. One is that, yes, we are happy about Maputo protocol, but it still has limitation because a woman has to be raped or have mental problem to, to, to benefit from a, a safe abortion. But we want to get that first, but moving on advocacy to go behind so that this will not be about what the system decide, but about women's choice, about women's bodily autonomy. Hello? Hello? We can hear you. Okay, okay, thank you. And also working in, in, Sorry, in the part yeah, sharing experiences from what happening in other regions but also in other countries. The other challenge that uh, uh, we had is data, having quality data that had to do with unsafe abortion to back up our advocacy, because this is, has been illegal for so long. And uh, uh, even uh, uh, studies on abortion itself was not, we did not have that much data to support our arguments when doing uh, um, advocacy. And IPRIS coming into DRC has really pushed this work that we've been doing for so many years have been, have been pushed and, uh, by uh, IPRIS in the DRC. And now we, we are at least able to, to talk about abortion and we've gone into partnership with uh, Ministry of Health and also Ministry of Gender because this is about women, it's not just about health 
uh, as I said before, it's about uh, women's bodily or Autonomy. Working into synergy has supported our advocacy, and this will bring me up to, to appreciate the uh, presentation that came before. And even in terms of having data to back up our advocacy, IPAS and Good Maker did uh, a few uh, uh, studies and now we have really moved a few steps ahead uh, and we still need this uh, uh, global synergy to support uh, our advocacy down here in the, the DRC so that, uh, like I mentioned before, we can go behind Maputo protocol and talk about abortion as the issue that is affecting women's development, women's economic empowerment in uh, uh, the context. So yeah, are you, the meeting was al already closing. I think I, I, will, I will end there and also support the three points, comprehensive sexual education. Uh, it's also being stopped by religious beliefs. The religion has got a huge, uh, uh, um, is a huge uh, uh, barrier in terms of women accessing quality information in regard to their sexual and reproductive health. Because in our case in the Democratic Republic of Congo, we have 90% of population who are Christian and Christianity deals with sexuality as a taboo. So we are also, developing few partnership with progressive pastors and few priests to get slowly uh, to access majority of population that are alienated or are following uh, uh, the uh, message that they're giving. So to talk of comprehensive sexual education, we have to think of um, uh, uh, multiple stakeholders who have influence over uh, women over community because a woman can only choose when they have quality information so they can take uh, an informed decision on what they want and what they do not want to do with their body. Thank you so much for this panel. Annie, thank you very, very much. I'm so glad that we were able to hear you and, and to hear the, the amazing work that, that you're doing on DRC. And, and you brought one, one key element talking about policy, like the Maputo protocol, who has been so crucial to advance the agenda. And I mean, like the sexual and reproductive health and rights agenda. And as you well said, it's not enough, but, but at least it's a very strong, um, a element that you can use to to advance to to advance the agenda and I like at, at the beginning like side had some questions from the audience in terms of what is the linkages of this international or regional documents with a uh, women's empowerment and 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 the kind of like development so i think that like maputo the maputo protocol and plan of action is one of those so i know that we are already uh, over times again i want to thank you all um, and thank you all the audience i i hope that that you go away well with like with the information about these exciting initiatives like i mean like the work that bethany was uh, sharing about the helms amendment uh, the the work that uh, both annie and Sai share in terms of the work that people's doing in different regions to advance the agenda and connecting the dots like really like learning from each other and then this point about like uh, thinking about and I think that some of people in the audience like said something um, about a well search your heart uh, what's what's your agenda like I mean so I think that I hope that we all like yeah Marsha MacArthur thank you very much like saying like a uh, search your heart what's your agenda if women it's in the core of your agenda Please fight for things that give her agency, that give her autonomy and give her the possibility to decide over her life. It's going to pay off. Like when women are, are making decisions about their lives, we all benefit from it. So thank you very much. And uh, I wish you two very exciting weeks of, of CSW. 
Thank you. And thank you, Ceci, for all the coordination for putting this together. Bye. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Thank you all so much. Goodbye. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, everyone. Casey? Yes. Uh, I don't want to ruin the recording, so <laughs> if you can make sure that it's safe. Uh, no, not yet. We still have 21. Uh, we still have eight participants. Let me okay. check who that is. Thank you all so much for being here. Adelaide, Alejandra, Chelsea, Diana. Thank you so much. We hope you have a wonderful two weeks at this fantastic virtual forum. I will leave now, okay? Thank you. Okay, bye.